can convey to you this evening the importance of a point involving health that perhaps is best expressed through the Beatitudes as we find them set forth in the book or Gospel according to Matthew. Here we are given a series of statements which form a preface to the Sermon on the Mount. And as we study them, examine them, we are impressed by a peculiar quality which seems to permeate all of these statements. And because of the peculiar nature of the statements themselves, and the fact that so many of them seem to run contrary to our normal inclinations, I think we should try to think in terms of the total concept of health. We are more and more convinced that our physical health is part of a larger picture. The individual cannot be psychologically sick and physically well. Nor can he be truly healthy if in his consciousness he does not have certain basic convictions. Now the nature of these convictions being controversial we have to face the natural reaction of mankind. In the Beatitudes, the emphasis is upon a very gentle humility. The emphasis is strongly upon the peculiar significance of moral suffering. And bearing this in mind, we come to one of the major issues of our time. Namely, can the individual practice the Beatitudes in this world without doing some kind of injury to himself, or perhaps an even greater injury to another person? Let us take this concept of meekness. Let us take the entire over-concept of kindness. We know there are people who would like to be kind. But in the process of being kind, they have made a discovery that is a little disconcerting. They have found, for instance, that their kindness is exploited. They also find that perhaps even worse, their kindness is mistaken for weakness and they seem to cause other people to become more arrogant, more critical, and more unkind. Until today, the attitude has been, or gradually certainly is pointing toward, the belief that we have to fight, that we cannot hold these gentle thoughts within ourselves, and not suffer an unreasonable degree of exploitation, or perhaps even apparently contribute to the delinquencies of others. If we are kind and others are cruel, and we remain kind, they seem to get more cruel instead of getting more kind. How are we going to face this? The Christian scriptures do not really tell us how to face this. They simply tell us to do it. And offer certain moral inducements as set forth in the Beatitudes. Yet there has to be perhaps a little clearer judgment on this in order to clarify the matter. Suppose the individual 
does try very sincerely and very devoutly to be the gentle, kind, thoughtful, patient person that he feels would be consistent with a good life. He must then, of course, naturally expect certain reactions. He is not going to find the good life easier to live than a poor one. He is not going to find that everyone understands him or appreciates him. But such is not intended, such is not implied. He lives the bad life, so people still do not understand him and still do not appreciate him. The more unpleasant his own actions, the greater others find justification for disliking him. The life of the individual who proceeds arrogantly and pressurefully toward the accomplishment of his end is not a happy life. He therefore substitutes certain concepts of success for happiness and is rewarded with a great deal of misery and sickness. If, on the other hand, he is able to preserve his principles, he certainly has certain securities within himself. Securities which Western man has not learned to value, but which undoubtedly become more essential as civilizations grow older and their cultures become more involved. The second problem is the effect of what the early Christian mystics call the Christ way upon the conduct of others. At what point should we have righteous indignation? At what degree of personal disillusionment should we turn and fail to perform these practices which are essentially right? I think perhaps Buddhism clears this thing for us more more truly, more simply, and more directly, even than Christianity does. Buddhism, with a strange, almost fearful frankness, says that which is right is right and must be done. That which is wrong is wrong and must not be done. In the presence of that, there is no compromise of personal feelings. So we can ask the Buddhist thinker, to what degree should our kindliness, therefore, be perpetuated if it causes others to impose upon us? We are meek, we are gentle, we more or less open ourselves to their rebuttals. They see that we are not belligerent. Therefore, they continue their attack upon us for whatever reason may induce them. Buddhism says that is none of our business. No one can actually cause another person to do ill because the first person does right. The reason for this wrong action in the individual who takes advantage of our kindliness lies in himself, lies in his own psychic integration or lack of it. The problem is his. Our problem is to do that which we know to be right, according to the best and most complete motives that we have. Where right seemingly produces wrong, an examination will generally, uh, generally disclose a deficiency in motive. Sometimes we are kind because we are afraid. This is not good. 
Sometimes we are gentle simply because we do not want to take the responsibility of a positive decision. This is not good. So Buddhism asks us further, when we say we want to be kind, what is kindness? Is kindness ultimately being kindly to ourselves? Or is it doing that which is necessary or most needs to be done? If the individual's so-called kindness is merely a veil for weakness, it offers him no protection. But if his kindness is an unselfish and certain desire to serve the common good, or to assist and direct that which needs assistance and direction, his kindness will be proper and right, to the degree that his own understanding and his own judgment have been reasonably developed. A religious life, therefore, or a life close to principle, demands insight. It, dem it demands that we do not keep terms according to dictionary definitions but according to the degrees of understanding within our own nature. Kindness is therefore not a quality merely to be practiced from books or from common codes, but from a deeper source of, in, of inspiration and understanding within ourselves. No one without insight can be certain that he does well. No one without insight can be sure that he helps. Only the individual who has achieved a certain degree of personal orientation can be a useful servant or a kindly guide in the life of another. These considerations bring us back to the health problem. Regardless of provocation, Regardless of circumstances, negations and negatives destroy. Every time the individual loses his own mental or emotional equilibrium, he is in trouble. The reason he loses it, the degree of pressure that has been brought upon him, the inducements to lose equilibrium, or the stress and strain of the conditions which caused him to lose it. These are of very slight importance. The desperate fact is that he lost it. Righteous indignation is no less toxic than any other kind. Now that's just the trouble. And regardless of how much provocation you may have, a bad disposition will cause ulcers. You may regard yourself as the most abused of mortals, which is itself more or less a good reason for ulcers. But the moment your own consciousness moves away from a tranquil, normal, gentle, adjusted state of relationship with others, and with yourself, the moment you lose that center, you begin to pay. Now sometimes the payment is long deferred. Often we do not notice it right then and there. But the day will come when every immoderation in man must take its toll. Obviously a very rare and exceptional, exceptional incident may have very little accumulative power. But we observe in living that the complainer and the blamer gradually develop chronic attitudes. And these attitudes are wrong. We cannot afford them. We cannot live with them. And each neg a negative impulse that comes into expression in us is a potential enemy that will 
detract from every good thing in life as far as we are concerned. We simply cannot afford these attitudes, especially in times of stress and strain when our every resource is needed to meet the problems of living. If you study the magnetic field of the human body, you will realize that one good mad, one good unpleasant spell, lasting maybe 30 minutes or an hour, will take as much energy out of your system as you would require in the constructive reading and studying of a thousand-page book. It will also take out of your system the vitality that you need for the proper digestion of food for the maintenance of bodily economy. The individual who has a quick temper can waste more vitality on that temper than on all his other activities put together, and he gets nothing for it. The only possible reward will probably be bad chemical imbalance. Now, there's a great temptation to fly off the handle. Everyone has moments in which it almost seems that we can't endure anything else. But at that moment, something else arrives. <laughs> we come to the breaking point and we then express ourselves. Or misrepresent ourselves. We feel a little better afterwards, perhaps tired, but convinced that we are actually operating under a powerful Freudian license. <laughs> we are assured that if we extrovert thoroughly, we will never have the ailments and misfortunes of introverts. We won't. We will have the ailments and misfortunes of extroverts. <laughs> and of course, with the extrovert, we will spread it further than the introvert does. <laughs> extroverts seldom suffer alone. The extrovert, however, certainly does not have this peculiar digging in quality, the deeply retained, powerfully held attitudes will give. But the extrovert also develops bad habits. He loses the energy necessary to do things. He is constantly depleting himself. Now, if it was just energy that was getting away, it might be not so bad. But every negative attitude has a psychic vibratory rate that is a corrosive and a destroyer. Every negative impulse of man does something to his total psychic economy. It eats in. It is like rust or decay. It is an acid which affects health and destroys a certain amount of internal psychic structure. As a result of this, nature has set up its own rules. In fact, nature has always had them. Man, however, is the only creature that we know that can develop and hold certain attitudes simply because of the acuteness of his memory and the strength of his imagining and visualizing faculties. Every word or term which to us represents a disagreeable or distasteful attitude is also a synonym for a potential health problem. There are health problems that belong to people who have too much ambition. Others for people who have too little. There are some persons whose health problem rests simply upon the shoulder of prejudice. These individuals have nursed prejudices all day.
sleep lives. They have set up vibrations which have affected and will continue to affect health. There is only one attitude that nature will actually support in man without punishing him for it in some way. And that is tranquility. The moment he leaves it, something goes wrong. Now in the material way of life, the moment we attain it, everything seems to go wrong. For tranquility seems to take away from us the very things the world most demands. But the demands of the world, if you will study history, have never led us very far in the direction of any solution. <coughs> the thoughtful, tranquil, integrated human being realizes that he is not here to cater to the demands of the world. He is not here to conform with others. He is here to cooperate with them in every way that he can. But he is also here for the purpose of growth. He is here to unfold his own potential and not sacrifice it uh, to the whimsies of his associates. Tranquility, therefore, represents very largely the cultivation of a nature without excess or deficiency. A nature in which there is a strong central core of quietude to which this individual can turn in an emergency and which is truly his ever-present help in time of trouble. If he has this internal zone of quietude, he will go further to preserve his health than by any other instrument or device that he can conceive or devise. So health begins with order. It begins with the individual recognizing that excess kills and that he does not necessarily perform an excess only when he eats too much or drinks too much. These are obvious excesses. Others are when he worries too much. Others in Gen when he fears too much, and perhaps one of the saddest, when he hopes too much, and because he hopes unreasonably, is subject to disappointment. Now nearly every negative condition that arises in us arises also from the fact that we are wrong about something. And nature never rewards wrongness except with grief. We live in a kind of world in which we would like to think that the universe is a doting parent always ready to spoil us, willing to forgive and forget everything, and willing to listen to our apologies in hours of misery and forget our mistakes in hours of glee. We do not live in that kind of a universe. If we did, the great moral structure of our nature could never grow, because we would live in a sphere of special privileges, and this would be a dishonest sphere to start with. Nature, therefore, is not much concerned with our excuses, only with the direct values of conduct. And nature has a wonderful way of impelling us uh, to improve, to correct, and to reform by making present conditions unendurable. This is true on the level of health problems. I think, therefore, that we have to realize that there is a strange parallel that we must keep 
And that is in the eyes of nature, if we want to be healthy, we have to be good. And there's just no way of getting away from this implication. We are not terribly interested in being good, and it interferes somewhat with some program we already have in mind. Then we must be prepared to be unhealthy and like it. Because no one made us unhealthy but ourselves. And as we go along through life, it may well occur that we do not wake up to some of these things as early as we might. And because through circumstances the facts have never been driven home to our attention, we may reach middle life before we begin to realize just what it means to keep the rule. About what is gone and past, there is very little that we can do except follow the advice of Buddha who patted a disciple on the shoulder and said to him endure it brother endure it but there is always the important consideration that the moment we know discover or become convinced from that moment we can do there's something we can do about it the moment we know we should now in this peculiar world of tensions and stresses, there is nothing that would be more important to most folks than peace of mind, or peace of internal life. Therefore we have to cultivate it, by carefully guarding ourselves against such indiscretions and attitudes as will destroy it. It's very little use trying to constantly inhibit ourselves by refusing merely to do the things which we have already experienced as a powerful impulse. The mistake has been made already when the impulse is already strong within us. The problem is the re-education of the total person so that the impulses which are unreasonable and irrational simply do not arrive. Now this kind of education or orientation has been completely ignored by Western man for five or six thousand years. We have made no conscientious effort to formulate a great educational policy to help the individual to find his own internal securities. We culture his mind, we educate his faculties, but we do not integrate his internal resources. Thus the individual, for the most part, does not know how to do it, even when the need arises. He founders around trying to find some answer to his problem and ultimately, perhaps, discovers in religion or philosophy uh, the medicine he seeks. The Greeks declared philosophy to be medicine for the soul, simply because wisdom tempers excess. The wise man cannot worry. Now that does not mean that the wise man isn't thoughtful. There's a great deal of difference between giving a subject its full consideration and just good old-fashioned blind fear. There is a great deal of merit in forethought, in the careful examination of values to determine the probable outcomes of circumstances. There are many ways of meeting solutional problems that require immediate attention. But worry is none of those ways. Worry only weakens the person and makes solution more difficult and leads to desperate and further irrational action. Therefore, the wise do not worry. But they may be very seriously concerned with values. 
the wise also cannot be afraid, because they have learned that there is a truth beyond all doubt, that man never has anything to fear but fear. Fear is a positive statement of unbelief. It is the individual taking the ground in himself that the universe is an accident, that values are not real or important. Fear is the individual expecting that some ill that he does not deserve shall come upon him, or some good that he does not deserve will not come upon him. Thus, fear is an anxiety mechanism which can be compensated only by the attainment within of personal tranquility. Such other emotions as greed or avarice, selfishness, things of this kind, are all, therefore, rooted in ignorance, representing actual statements of human limitation and human mental emotional dishonesty. If we permit these things, we must pay for them not only in terms of health, but in terms of consequences. And very often, a bad example of poor judgment will cause the individual so many material and physical involvements that he will wreck his health because of his worries over them. Thus this vicious circle of worry, or of any other negative attitude, will continue to perpetuate itself until finally it destroys the entire psychic economy. For man must decide in his own nature what is more important, to be fashionable or to be healthy. The lady has to decide sometimes when she measures the height of the heels on her shoes. She can wear four-inch heels, but she can't be healthy. Now, which is the one that is the more important? To some, vanity. But after the aches and pains set in, there's usually a change of mind, and the individual begins to find the virtues of moderation. The man out trying to make his million, overdoing, lacking proper relaxation and balanced avocational activity, soon breaks down and must decide whether he wishes to be healthy or whether he merely wishes to be the richest man in the local cemetery. He must decide. And his decision involves his survival. On the great basic principle, therefore, man's decision to keep the faith, to keep the principles of life, is the decision which determines the measure of his life, determines whether he shall suffer for the mistakes of others by copying them, or whether he will cling to that which he knows to be right and pay in terms of material or psychological factors whatever this costs in terms of moderation and the limitation of resources on other levels. He also can determine to what degree other people's opinions and attitudes are going to destroy his tranquility. If they can destroy his tranquility, then his own internal center is not right. Because this tranquility which he seeks is an attribute of God itself, an attribute of divine power. If he possesses it, no outside circumstance can destroy it. 
and if his resolutions and his dreams and his hopes fade under the first onslaught, then they are not real. He hasn't discovered or integrated the resources that he needed. Today, we live almost totally in a world of compromise. We take it for granted that we have to put up with the idiosyncrasies of others, and as a normal, fair exchange, they must put up with ours. We consider certain delinquencies as necessary evils. We do not feel particularly conscience-stricken because we are gossip or because we nag, or because we want what we want, regardless of the cost, we assume that everyone feels this way. Well, perhaps most do. But if you go back through history, you'll find that everyone has been a little miserable. Most people more than a little sick. And that very few people have lived the full span of their expectancy in a reasonable degree of health. It therefore makes very little practical difference when we try to justify or excuse. So did our ancestors and their ancestors. And they were rewarded with war, crime, sin, and death. Compromise is not possible. And it seems to me that that is one of the, of the great burdens that a spiritual or religious ministry of health must bring home to people. Faith is a tremendous healing power. But a mere believing that has no ground in conduct will not work miracles. Today we are much concerned with psychology and psychiatry. We know that modern man has involved himself in such a complex mental-emotional procedure that he may very likely break under it. We assume that a successful man will have at least two nervous breakdowns during life. If he doesn't, uh, there's something a little wrong with him. We expect strong people to be unpleasant. We excuse them for it. We expect genius to be eccentric. And most people expect to be eccentric without being geniuses. <laughs> this type of broad compromise has never won and never will. It cannot. So today our search for help is essentially our search for truth. It is our search for faith, for wisdom, for reality, on any level that we may conceive of this term. For it is only upon the foundation of a real life that we can hope to have the strength, the available resources, and the spiritual, psychical inducements to act in a constructive and consistent manner. We all regret when a terrible tornado strikes one of our cities, tears down buildings, and destroys life and devastates properties. Yet within ourselves such tornadoes are not unusual. And they destroy just as certainly as one of those drifting in from the Gulf of Mexico. These tornadoes of tension, pressure, lack of self-control, this overindulgence of negation and emotion within our own nature, as a frightful result. Could we see it? Could these things be changed from mysterious invisible vibrations 
two powerful, visible, tangible symbols. The average person would never lose his temper again. Um, a good example, of course, has been the work with children. Children get temper fits. One remedy is to put a mirror in front of the child and let him see his own face when he's angry. Generally, it has quite a specific effect. He doesn't like himself that way. We do not any of us like ourselves particularly that way. But we probably forget the episode and then wonder why other people don't. And this situation leads us on and on through the mysteries of health. Do you realize how many things can be wrong with you? Do you realize how much they can be wrong before you even know it? Because of the wonderful adaptability of the body and its immense compensatory power, it takes more abuse, perhaps, than any other structure in nature. It fights on and on, undernourished, perversely polluted, toxin ridden, and most of all driven by an irrational, erratic will. It becomes the patient servant of an individual who is constantly doing things of no importance, either to the body, or to as far as that is concerned, to the individual himself. There is little, if any, thought that we live in a world of use and abuse. If we use, we live. If we abuse, we die. We just do not like to think in such brutal terms. But the body has to take this punishment morning, noon, and night. And from the time we awake until the time we go to sleep, the average individual is pretty brutal to this instrument of flesh and blood upon which he depends so much. If he tried to keep a violin that way, it would have no tone in three days. If he neglected an automobile, it would be a wreck in a month. Yet he goes on trying to force this body, simply because it is his, to carry on this incredible struggle against the being that lives within it. Finally, it breaks. And in the breaking, precipitates us into an ineffective state which makes us all the more irritable, all the more discontented, and even more inclined to believe that there is no decent providence in the universe. So, hell is something that is infinitely personal. And we have no right to let other people or our world make us sick. And we have no right to make other people and our world sick because of us. We have no right to in any way contribute to the natural and proper burdens of mankind which are heavy enough for all practical purposes. Thus, we have to have a code, a way of life, that begins to clear these things. Always in philosophy and religion, man has devised and unfolded disciplines. Disciplines are rules which the individual imposes upon himself. In our world, we just love to make rules for other people. But in nature, we must apply them to ourselves. So a discipline is an acceptance of the need for planned existence. Every structure, every institution that man knows must have rules. If these are continually disregarded, the entire structure collapses. The same is true of health. We have finally fought out the problem of sanitation. We have cured 
the, the misery of lack of hygiene. We have step by step rescued ourselves from most of the environmental plagues that once decimated our kind. And we have made no major frontal attack on the plagues within, which ruin us, limit us, frustrate us, usually at that very time in life, when otherwise we might be in the best position to live intelligently. To find out these rules, then, and to abide by them, is not only good sense, but an absolute requirement of nature. So discipline comes in. And how do we understand this term? Discipline is the individual starting on a course of conduct governed by rules or principles greater than his own passing moods and fancies. Usually discipline begins by attaching our own need to some well-recognized and ordered plan of procedure. Just as the child who wishes to be apprenticed to a carpenter finds it necessary to take training from a professional, a practicing exponent, a master of the craft, so man seeking for the solution to his own irrational tendency seeks the rules from those where he believes such rules can be found. And we have great systems of rules, such as those outlined by Plato or Buddha or Confucius or Jesus or Mohammed. Rules being things that must be understood and accepted. Now, by acceptance, we mean that they must be internally agreed to, <coughs> voluntarily, by the person involved. A total acceptance of the desirability of a certain program must precede its function. A rule is not something that we agree to with the mind alone, but that we accept as far as possible, first with the heart, and finally justify with the mind. In other words, the acceptance must be real, must be vital, must be because either through wisdom or emergency, we know it to be necessary now. In the Eastern Buddhistic faith, this acceptance begins with a new evaluation of the proper way to live, involving every phase of practical living, food, clothing, habits. The individual must gradually decide what constitutes the way of life most conducive to the advancement of the humanity in the human being. If he does not so wish to choose, he does not have to. He can keep right on suffering. But he has only the two choices. Learn the rule or suffer. There is no other choice, no way in which he can take it up with his attorney and arbitrator. He must meet the requirement, must face the issue fairly and squarely. He must decide whether he wishes to live with himself or be applauded by foolish people around him, whether he wants to keep the rules of life or whether he wishes to merely abide by the rules of a society when from the beginning of time this society has always failed and died. Once he has decided in his own mind what he wants to do, he will find gradually increasing availability of resource. 
he will discover that the energies that he has been wasting, wasting, trying to break rules successfully, which he can't do, is also available to help him keep them. He will also discover that the greatest freedom, the greatest liberty, the most perfect adjustment of the individual with society is by keeping the rules. And that what seems to be the contrary is little better than a nightmare. So we begin to think in terms of what these rules may mean. And we learn, for example, that we've got to do something about perhaps the greatest killer in the world, and that is selfishness. Because selfishness is a very acid thing. It ties up everything. It tightens it. It interferes with circulation. Breaks down arterial walls. It can lead us ultimately into a fine case of arteriosclerosis just by being selfish long enough. Selfishness is a killer because it is the source of most other killing attitudes and destructive emotions. So, we have to revise selfishness. Perhaps we can't eliminate it entirely, but perhaps we can discover that if we want to be truly, magnificently, dynamically, and utterly selfish, we must be good. Because that is the only way in which we can attain that which is best, and therefore which what that which we most ultimately and inevitably desire. So true selfishness teaches us the virtue of disposing of the false definitions and the false circumstances which have grown up around the concept of selfishness. It's like the old formula of success. One man says, take as much as you can, that's success. Another man says, give as much as you can, and ultimately you will succeed better. Experience on the economic level has shown that organizations that gave the least fell to pieces first, and those that gave the most lasted longest and ultimately had the best business. So you can have these long and short range viewpoints. Selfishness leads us to great tensions. And from these in turn, we gain very heavy psychic loads. Possession. The Buddhist monk was taught that he could possess nothing. That even the shroud that he used for a robe was not his own. The Essene in the Holy Land, the school of mystics to which some believe Jesus belonged, did not even permit their members to own their own clothing. The clothing belonged to the order. No man could own anything. Well, you will say, there will be the end of our economy. Now comes the Great Depression of all times. Don't worry, no one is going to change that rapidly. We haven't a thing to worry about in that direction. Our great worry is that they will not change. Actually, neither Christianity nor Buddhism means by this sense of freedom from possession that the individual should turn around and give away to someone who cannot use it any better than he can the things which he possesses. To so do might only be to wreck another life. That is not the concept. It is not administration, stewardship, that is involved. It's the strange psychic tragedy of things being mine. The terrible fight to hold on to them. The terrible fear that we shall lose them. These things change various so-called worldly goods into horrible, terrible burdens. Whereas if we accept, steward, accept stewardship to use as wisely as we can, to cheerfully accept and equally cheerfully pass on to others, 
only knowing that we cannot take these things beyond this earthly life in any event, then we can use things, we can help other people with things, we can advance our own destiny with things, and yet never for a moment be their servants. And then, when we reach that state, that's usually good for from two to three years of additional life. Because we certainly waste that amount of time on these negative attitudes. I knew a man who admitted that he'd had a mad for 20 years. The only thing he really enjoyed for 20 years was his extreme irritation at another person. That really made life worthwhile for him. Well, most people do not manage to have one mad that long. But they have an assortment of them. And in, say, 20 years of living, the individual may have several thousand hours that have been wasted on negative attitudes. He may have impoverished his own living to that degree in time alone. Every moment devoted to a negative attitude was equivalent to a moment dead. During those hours, nothing valuable occurred. Nothing important could be accepted. So the long periods of human emotional and mental inclemency are just as much periods of death as though the person was in the grave. For while these are upon him, he is not living. He is merely automatically reflexing to the intemperances of his own nature. He is really doing nothing, he is being nothing. Therefore he is dead. Out of all of these considerations, we can perhaps come to the idea of the Beatitudes, realizing that they do represent something that modern psychology cannot give the individual. Because psychology can ventilate him, it can integrate him, do all kinds of things, but it cannot put new values into the human being. He has to put them there himself. And if having had his little mental slate all neatly washed clean by psychotherapy, he returns to his own habits and scribbles some other strange complex design upon it, he will simply be sick again in six weeks. He will merely fall out of one confusion to fall into another. Or he will say to himself, the mistake that I made and got me into this all this trouble, I'll never make it again. Perhaps he won't. But he'll make a brand new one within 24 hours which has just as much potential for causing difficulty. Therefore, the correction of single mistakes, the effort to get over this fault or that fault, or to recognize how bad a temper can be, or what worry has done to you, or what prejudice can do to you, that is perhaps educational, but it is not solutional. So the solution lies in changing the internal focus so that all these negative things do not come out of a Pandora's box every time you lift the lid. The individual should be able to open his own internal life without some unpleasant gadfly coming out. It should be perfectly possible for him to open his mouth without even thinking and something nice express itself. There's no need why he should always be censoring himself or watching for his own mistakes. He should not be constantly in the mood of making them. And out of this need comes some kind of a code that must inspire him. Well, the code that has inspired the Christian world for the last 1950 years has been very largely the teachings of Jesus. And because they are familiar to nearly everyone, and because we have a strong subconscious sympathy for these ideals, recognizing great beauty in them, 
whether we can follow and obey or not, there is a kind of low resistance against this type of teaching. We are almost willing to accept it. We would accept it probably immediately if we could be sure that others would. Probably nine-tenths of competition would cease today if each competitor was convinced that his competitor would be less competitive. But no one can afford to be the only competitor who stops competing. It gets to be very difficult. And yet, this does not prevent all the competitors from ultimately having ulcers. The only one who hasn't the ulcer is the one who stops competing. Now, he may be a little poorer, he may be in some other line of business, but he's healthier. And sometimes this health problem gets so acute that we must decide between competition, bringing death, and cooperation, bringing life. Ultimately, the major decision comes to each one of us. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, gave us a series of statements which are not original with him. Most of the Beatitudes are derived from the Old Testament, particularly the book of Psalms. And for nearly each one of them, you can find a very nice corollary in the book of Psalms. One or two are traceable to the Talmud and other Jewish sacred writings or various teachers and leaders among the early Jews. But they are brought together in a very wonderful order. Today, analyzing the entire sermon critically, we are inclined to feel that probably it was not delivered at one time, that it represents what might be termed an ideal sermon, in which practically everything that on a certain level of sublimity uh, inspired the perpetuation of the record. Everything was brought together and made into one master sermon that seemed to teach the most and explain the most and give the most comprehensive total concept of the teachings of the master. This may be why the Beatitudes uh, more or less begin and form a little unit that the sermon then goes on and through it here and there, we can observe tendencies which indicate breaks and probabilities of piecing or bringing together elements not originally related. But in any event, we have them. And they constitute in themselves a series of remarkable admonitions. Further than this, we know from the commentary material in the Psalms and other works but we have to be just a little careful in our understanding of the translated words. Because in those days we did not have as elaborate a vocabulary or as complete a one as we have now. And it was not always possible to find just the best word. But from the Psalms and other places where the statements are made in other words, but with the same obvious idea, we get a pretty clear picture of what is intended. Now the term beatitude is applied to a series of statements beginning, Blessed are, and each of the beatitudes opens with that poem. And uh, in order that uh, you may all remember them, I'll read the beatitudes <coughs> to you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. This is in substance the, the statement. So let's examine a few of them a little bit more carefully to find out why all these things, which at the moment seem rather unpleasant and uh, frustrating, should have with them such a notable quality of blessedness. So we begin with the problem, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now if we go into the old Jewish writings, we find out how this is termed is used. Poor in spirit is not here used in the sense of the meek or the impoverished. The poor in spirit are those, according to the Jewish concept, that are not arrogant. Arrogance was this false richness of the spirit against which the beatitude is particularly direct. The poor in spirit are therefore the modest. Those having essential humbleness or humility of spirit. And this would be in perfect accordance even with your Eastern doctrine. For this poverty of spirit means lack of self-pride and also lack of self-will. Now, today we honor self-will as being something rather good. And yet, whenever we use the term willful, we have a subtle implication of negation. When we say a person is willful, we do not really admire him for it. It is a kind of strength which is not essentially good. The kind of strength in which the individual is forcing his own purpose upon others or is attempting in some mysterious way uh, to usurp prerogatives which are not his own. Milton describes self-will as the sin for which fell the angels. And this self-will or arrogance, or spiritual sense of sufficiency, falsely attained, the kind of spirituality that quickly leads to intolerance. The th same thought that Jesus associated with the Pharisees, and how thankful they were that they were not like other folks, that they were set apart, that they were sanctified. And this causes us also to bear in mind the struggle of creeds and all the innumerable prejudices that arise in the life of man in his desperate effort to defend the sense of his own rightness. So that the beatitude admonishes us to relax, be receptive instead of objective, uh, to rather ask than to tell, to rather seek to know than to exhibit the knowledge that we possess, not to take the sense or attitude that we are rich in spiritual graces, but that we are probably poor in such graces, and that therefore we must depend upon the goodness, the wise administration, the benevolence, the protective agency, the infinite munificence of God, truth, life, and nature. Thus by this, the individual is reminded that no matter what he knows, he is not spiritually rich. That regardless of what he possesses, he is not spiritually rich. And that the spirit is a strange thing which is almost vowed to poverty. It is a strange, humble thing. Its voice so subtle and so slight that it can never be heard while any other voice is speaking. 
unless perchance we are able to find it in the total voice of life itself. Therefore, that man must take a receptive, quiet, benevolent, penitent attitude toward the internal source of his own truth. He can never try to storm the gates of his own inner life, but that by sitting quietly, receptively, humbly, he may hear the voice of the silence. He may know the life and counsel. And by so doing, will re realize or understand that no being is ever sufficient in itself, but all equally dependent upon the one life. I remember one of the old monastic orders who said, uh, one of whose leaders said, Men are the beggars of God. Sounds strange, but I think he meant it in the sense that every living thing must carry its arms dish and accept the gift of total life from the universe. That no one can actually take an aggressive or positive attitude toward this universal life. We can know it only if we are receptive to it. So that the poor in spirit are those who take an accepting or receptive attitude toward universals. That realize that they do not know all, that they will not possess all, but that they can be still and receive all by a strange and wonderful mystery of life itself. The uh, Psalms sustain this concept as underlying the meaning and our health axiom, our psychological axiom here, lies in this same uh, department. Modern psychology is just as mind-bound as modern medicine is body-bound. We are completely captured now by the thought of how wonderful the mind is. It's been troublesome, but still, it is a thing of beauty and a joy forever. Actually, the mind is only a catalyzing agent. The mind will never solve our problem. The mind will never bring us world peace, because there is no peace in it. The mind depends upon something superior to itself, even as the body does. And the great duty of the mind is to become receptive to essence, to the spiritual power of becoming that is eternally behind it. The arrogance of the mind, and the ancients used the word mind very largely as we would use high-spirited or uh, convinced, proud, boastful. The mind must relax and become able to accept the impulses of a superior agent. And until the mind admits that life is its master and not its servant, we will solve nothing. Because as with the mind as master, we will simply tear life to pieces to satisfy the ambitions of the intellect. So mind must subordinate itself to life. And this is a gentle recognition that the unknown is greater than the known at <coughs> all times. And the result is this peculiar sense of the poverty of spirit. The receptivity, the accepting power of the gentle life, the gentle heart, the gentle soul. In these things we find that tranquility, that peace which transcends pressure, tension, agitation. Now the second point the second of these is, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
This seemingly is derived in part at least from a section of the Babylonian Talmud. And the point involved in it is rather subtle and very interesting. The Beatitude seems to suggest that by moaning or mourning, the condition of grieving for the dead And uh, this particular type of grieving had much significance for older man than we know today, because it became an essential part of their way of life. To grieve is to some mysterious way break through for most people the barriers between themselves and a universal acceptance. Today, as never before, we realize that it is only the individual in trouble who seeks truth. It is only the individual who senses the insufficiency of what he knows that wants more knowledge. And usually the great causes of human growth are pain, Misery, calamity, grief, loss. When these things strike us materially, they for the first time break the strange hypnotic influence of worldliness upon the inner life of the individual. It is not until we begin to recognize that these things around us are not solutions that we will ever turn from them and seek elsewhere. Therefore, this concept of the blessedness of a kind of sorrow or a kind of suffering that causes us to turn to the source of solution. There is no earthly reason and never has been why we should not follow some of the ancient pagan customs of going joyously along the road of growth, but we just don't do it. While things go well, we are sure of ourselves, than which there is no greater insecurity. While we are successful, we are right. Whether we are intelligent or not is not important. It is only, therefore, when we are jogged out of complacency, usually by loss, that we instinctively turn toward inner resource. It is then when we grieve for loss or moan for the dead that we must have a life of our own, that we must test our own resources to find whether we have the strength to stand on our own feet and in emergency to turn to the inevitable, unfailing and eternal companionship of the internal life. Thus, in this way, it seems as though sorrow or suffering is the blessed gateway to a greater life. We choose to go in through the little gate of pain, because it is the door opener. It is the eye and soul opener. And therefore, it is not something perhaps as evil as we think because in every instance it helps us to experience our own integrities. We are never more fortunate than when much is demanded of us, whether it be of understanding or wisdom or truth. Therefore, in this way, by turning to solution, we gain so much. A good example, in a way, of this is Alcoholics Anonymous, for it is only the alcoholic who really knows how to help and how important help is, and who has found the meaning of faith through his own tragedy. Thus he becomes strong and consecrated to serve others in need. The moment this happens, his experience is no longer a curse but a blessing because it has made of him 
the person he might never otherwise have been. So these adversities, infirmities, reverses can become the blessed doors that open into growth because they challenge the sufficiency of our former way of life. They present us with a crisis, with a critical situation. And then and then only will we actually uh, take stock of what we are and why we are not sufficient and secure. The Talmud gives us that as the general uh, thought in that connection. The third of the Beatitudes is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We have heard much in these days of God's meek. We have often wondered how it happens that meekness could inherit the earth. And probably the answer lies in the, imprint, in the immense survival power of simple things. If we believe in rebirth, of course, we can well assume that we must attain this degree of meekness before we can create a worldly situation that is right and proper and true. But with wars and rumors of wars, the meek will inherit the earth, because it is only the simple, the gentle, the kindly, those persons who are not obsessed by their own values, that are not limited by their own conceits, that are not in absolute slavery to their own opinions, who can ever administer the earth. <coughs> the proud and the ambitious will, ru will ruin <coughs> and always have. And uh, perhaps the ultimate state of the world may be a simple agrarian culture such as it was in the beginning. Perhaps a very simple world. A world of simple people who keep their principles and live them quietly and in an orderly manner. This great, tremendous complication of living through which we are now passing, of great industries, of great projects, all these things will ultimately pass away because none of them have ever solved or ever will solve the one thing that man is honestly and eternally seeking whether he expresses it adequately or not, that is all he really wants is happiness he has been falsely educated as to what will make him happy now he thinks he has to have 300 horsepower in his automobile or he is the most wretched of mortals. <laughs> this has nothing to do with happiness. Success as we know it has nothing to do with happiness. There will never be anyone truly happy unless he can attain that condition sitting quietly under a tree watching the sunset. Then and then alone can he be happy. He can only be happy when he can get along with himself. <clears throat> and he can only truly have every desire and impulse and instinct satisfied when his only remaining appetites, desires, and instincts are to love the beautiful and serve the good. Until that time, an intensely simple concept, he will always be struggling he will always be sick, he will always be fumbling, because what he really wants is peace of soul, peace of mind, and nothing that he is doing today is giving it to him. And in due time, the way of life which cannot succeed and is burying millions in its rubble will disappear because man will outgrow it and he will ultimately find that the end of all living, the end that he sought from the beginning is simply the quietude and peace of a gentle, loving, cooperative existence 
and that it will take very little of this world's goods to make him happy, that his happiness will come from his own creativity, from his wonderful privilege of looking out and contemplating the infinite symbolism of the divine will. Until then, he simply won't be happy. And ultimately, he will find this out. And just as primitive man had very little of this world's good, but goods but an infinite hope, ultimate man will have very little of this world's goods, but an infinite ultimate fulfillment. So in the quietude, gentleness of things, under a tree, the final human being will find the peace for which his ancestors fought and died, but which they never knew. So the meek, the gentle, the direct thinker, in any day, finds or inherits the earth. Now, inherits in a strange way, if you find it in some parts of the Old Testament, the word inherits does not mean that he possesses it. Inherits means more the ability to truly comprehend. We possess what we know. To know the world, to know the earth, is to possess its better part. Therefore, to inherit the earth means to discover the earth, perhaps, in its real dimensions. To find the true earth. To become, to a degree, aware of a kind of earth that he has never previously understood. And that is the earth which is not drenched with blood, but the earth which is full of seed, ever growing. And when man can inherit the true earth, it means that he has inherited the mystery of life, the mystery of growth, that he shares it, that he understands it, that he works with it. It becomes his garden, and he becomes a faithful gardener in it. It is a psychical situation, and on that level, man can inherit the earth truly any day, that he approaches it with understanding, rather than with the tendency he now has to ravish it, destroy it, and exploit it for his own use. He cannot make a slave of it, but it will become a glorious and beautiful servant of his understanding, and he cooperates with it in meekness, by which truly it becomes his, because he possesses only that which he understands. And to keep he can keep only that which he never abuses. And in this understanding he can inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Solomon and David both speak of righteousness. And this term is a very strange one. Righteousness does not mean learning. It does not mean wisdom. It does not mean understanding. Nor does it essentially mean illumination. It's a very strange word. Even the dictionary doesn't help us much. What is this righteousness that we are seeking to understand in this case? After which man may hunger and thirst I think perhaps the word righteous in this sense arises from rightness. Righteousness means the actual condition of being right with life. A state of rapport. A state of the complete identity of process between man and the laws of the universe around him. Righteousness is therefore to be filled with the rightness of reality. To possess or to be possessed by reality. It isn't an intellectual thing, it isn't an emotional thing. 
man hungers and thirsts after that which is real or that which is right to possess rightness or to be possessed by it is to live righteously so here we have an almost impersonal statement of extreme value and the importance of recognizing the tremendous requirement of being correct, being true, in the sense of experiencing or having moved into ourselves as nutrition this state of rightness. I think perhaps one way we could define this is by reference to Buddhism. Things are right or wrong. Wrong is error. Right is rightness. To practice wrong is to be a wrongdoer. To practice right is to be a right doer. And a right doer is righteous. It is therefore a motion from rightness. And the individual hungers and thirsts, desires with all the intensity of his being that he shall attain to this wonderful state of true rightness. We use the term so easily. Everyone thinks he's right. Everyone knows he's right and that everyone else is wrong. But that isn't the level of rightness to which I refer. This is the level of rightness born from insight. This is the rightness that comes at the end of a searching. The rightness of total agreement with truth. So that the individual is hungering and thirsting after being true. After being right after a state of absolute identity with reality. That reality shall be his guide, his leader, and the moving power within him makes him right. Man is not right of himself, but because he shares in a universal rightness. Here again we almost have the concept of good again. And Jesus rebuking the disciple. Only the Father is good. Only totality is right. Man hungering and thirsting after right is seeking, requiring reality. If he achieves this reality, he shall be filled with it. And being so filled with it, he shall live righteously. Now this, again, has its therapeutic value or implication. It causes man to realize that the total harmony of his nature, mental, spiritual, emotional, physical, must ultimately spring from total rightness. And that this total rightness is not his own personal ability to always keep the rule but is rather the rule moving through him and keeping him, feeding him, filling him, becoming a food within him by which all of his own needs and requirements are automatically nourished. The food of rightness in his own body would nourish him completely against sickness. It is this total nutrition Reality, totally feeding everything, like the fabulous penguin or uh, bird, pelican I guess it is, of the ancients that was always feeding its young from its own breast. Reality, forever, feeding all things from itself and uh, bestowing upon them eternal life. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. This is almost directly taken from the Talmud. This is practically one of the laws of Israel. 
For the Talmud says that no one who does not practice mercy and give mercy shall receive mercy. And that those who are merciful in the name of God shall receive to themselves the mercy of God. So that is the uh, uh, thought that we have there. What does merciful mean? That we shall not be cruel? I think the word merciful, as we find it in the old writings, has very much more the Buddhist concept of compassion. I think the merciful individual is the one who does not judge, who does not place his own code upon another person, but rather, in the name of truth, commends <coughs> those with whom he has problem or difficulty to the keeping of the universal law, taking to himself none of the prerogatives of the judge or the jury. Judge not, lest ye be judged. And with whatever measure of judgment ye judge, so shall it be judged unto you. Thus this concept of being merciful means not to condemn, not to bear witness against your neighbor or your friend or your world, but accept all things in the concept of compassion. Huan Xi'an, the deity of mercy in China, is called the goddess of mercy. And mercy is man's ability to express through himself the infinite solicitude of life for all that lives. That to the degree we are merciful, we are to a degree part of the great preserving stream of beauty. For mercy rises in nature's infinite power of the beautiful. And mercy like love. Uh, arises in the order, harmony, rhythm, pattern of the universe as grace, as beauty, as sublimity. So that mercy to the individual is the experience of the right to be kind, the right to forgive, the right to be godlike in an emergency in which it would be much easier not to be godlike. The infinite recognition, perhaps, that if deity can be tolerant of all things, man should be no less. And that it is not up to us uh, to pass judgment upon anything. Our only duty is to guard our own consciousness against negation. And in all others to seek the beautiful and serve the good. By taking this attitude, we come to a tranquility. We come to an integration and a peace within our own natures. We are no longer perturbed by the importance of judgment. It is not necessary for us to sit in solemn assembly. Rather, it is necessary only for us to continue to seek the good, to nourish it, to serve it and to unselfishly help others to release the beauty and sublimity locked within them by the circumstances of living. So the goddess of mercy represents this very principle, this principle of infinite compassion for all that lives, a compassion that leaves no place for condemnation, and as a result, no tension in ourselves, which will lead to further sickness and misery for us. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. This is a distinct statement of mysticism, because the seeing of God implies the development of the extrasensory gamut, particularly the mystical union or illumination. This is placed 
directly upon purity of heart, inasmuch as the heart is the seat of life, and it is what happens in the heart which very largely determines what occurs in the mind. Man moves from his emotional center, using his mind only to justify or sustain his impulses, his attitudes, and his instincts. Therefore, the pure of heart, like the famous Sir Galahad of the Arthurian Orders of the Quest, represents the individual who has experienced uh, the mystical baptism within himself, cleansed by the mystical experience, the development of true virtue, the development of true peace, the development of true life without ulterior motive, the dedication of conduct to the support of belief. When man's action and his belief are of equal and identical nature, then that individual has attained virtue. But virtue is not necessarily perfect action, nor necessarily perfect concept. Virtue is true obedience of action to concept. The individual who keeps his own rule is therefore virtuous, and the more noble the rule, the greater the virtue. In this case, our pure of heart represents one through whom, by dedication, by consecration, by the renunciation of error, the true mystical experience has become possible, an experience by which man becomes inwardly aware of the presence of God. Now, purity of vision, purity of faculty, purity of sense, purity of all kinds reveals deity. Pure sight, uncontaminated, would show us God in nature. Pure hearing, undefiled, would cause us to hear dearly in the winds. Everything which achieves the pure expression of itself discovers the universal behind the shadows of form and symbol. So purity is completeness. It is fullness. It is adequacy. It is the pure intuitive power by which all darkness or mystery is caused to depart, and we no longer see as through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So this is mysticism, the internal, mystical, apotheistic union, through devotion, through inspiration, through ecstasy, through the complete transcendence of illusion, through the complete achievement of the mystical state. This is the state, the rapture of the saint and the mystic, the individual who actually experiences what to himself certainly appears to be the immediate presence of the eternal power. This in itself, of course, must be regarded as an ultimate remedial agent, because in an instant, this, as in a moment of great faith, or of a tremendous exaltation of the spirit, becomes the basis of a complete repolarization of the entire physiological structure of the human being. If it is true and complete, it carries with it a tremendous psychophysical vitalizing force. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, and there is no group more likely to be misunderstood. The peacemaker is really not very welcome in our world. Yet, the peacemaker is perhaps the most important thing that there can be. 
We know, beyond any question of doubt, right here on the eve of Suez and the tragedy in Hungary, the war is wrong. We know that not only is war of this kind wrong, but the dissension of families is wrong. That enmity between former friends is wrong. Political hatreds are wrong. Religious hatreds are wrong. Any conflict between beings, particularly such conflicts as are held in the name of right or of truth, or of God. All such conflicts are undeniably and inevitably wrong. They spring from ignorance, selfishness, superstition, and fear, and have no other ground. Therefore, wherever it is possible, the peacemaker has a very valuable work to do. But perhaps he cannot do all these things. Like as not, he will not be invited to address the League of Nations or the United Nations organization. But he has another particular problem, as it points out here. The peacemakers shall be called the children of God. And if we can do nothing else, and our world is small, and our acquaintances few, and their feuds beyond our control, we can at least bring ourselves into internal peace and order. And you'd be surprised what an effect this has on other people. One of the reasons why peacemakers and arbitrators have not been successful is because they were never very good examples of their own profession. Actually, each time the individual is able to integrate a conflict within his own nature, Every time he is able to overcome a division of allegiances, of opinions, or beliefs within himself. Every time he can outgrow prejudices that divide him, feuding instincts that have possessed him, limitations that have separated him. The individual who can make peace with life within and peace totally with the world without establishing his own relationships with all things on a level of inevitable peace. That individual is called one of the children of God because he is practicing the way of life, the way of heaven, which is a way of peace. So when not quite sure how to be a good pacifist in an emergency, Organize your own resources. Be able to say that there is nothing within you that can rouse within you contention and nothing outside of you that can force you into a contentious position. And having achieved peace and tranquility, you will sleep better, eat better, digest your food better, and have better elimination. Because the moment you are warlike, you are tense, and every function binds itself into a hopeless discord. So that peace is health. Peace is health not only for the body, but for the soul. And it is very important that there shall be a healthy soul within a healthy body. So you can achieve peace when you seek it and find it within yourself. And having found it, you will find it easier to bestow upon others than if you haven't found it first yourself. To find it, you must be much wiser than we are today. Therefore, being much wiser, you can probably do better with national and international problems than we can do with our present wisdom. Now it says also here, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the beginning of the concept of martyrdom in the church. The idea that those who die for their faith or are persecuted and terribly injured for it have a peculiar and wonderful reward because of what they have done. 
Now this perhaps is a consolation clause in here to remind the individual that if he is unhappy, if he is a little poorer, if he is a little misunderstood, if he is a little neglected, if perhaps some of his temporal dreams are not fulfilled, because he has sought reality, that really he is not the poorer, that actually if he reaches that state in which he takes a firm and distinct stand against wrong values, the very experience of this stand has a tremendous effect upon him, strengthening him, enlarging him, making greater his way, so that we should not be disturbed because things do not always appear to work out well. In the great law of karma, in the great unfoldment of cause and effect, it is far more blessed to the, be the victim of ill than to be the causer of it. Each ill must be solved by the one who causes it. And in every case, if our wisdom and our understanding are greater, we have the power to accept, to transmute within ourselves the evils that others would do us. And therefore, if we are truly more enlightened, they cannot hurt us, but they can hurt themselves. And having recognized this fact, it is also our opportunity and our privilege to try to instruct them away from this disaster. So that the individual who injures us is in great need of us. Great need of the understanding which he does not have. And those who because they are able to understand this and transform this within themselves, are not injured by injury, are not hurt because others have tried to hurt them, but have a greater wisdom and a greater understanding. For such as this is reserved the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of of the new Jerusalem, the city of peace. So that uh, those who are not moved by persecution or by the reviling of others are really more fortunate by far than they would be could they come back and be victors in some kind of of a moral and ethical conflict. They are victors by keeping the peace, which is the supreme victory in life, beyond which there can be no greater achievement. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus, in this case, personifies truth. And he tells the world that there is no higher honor and no greater glory than that men who are ignorant shall revile us because we are true. That unless in some way we thus stand out against the many, we cannot be true. If we receive the plaudits of all, we must be wrong. When Socrates was speaking in Athens, the audience suddenly broke into applause. He turned to Alcibiades and he said to him, What foolish thing have I said, that all men should thus applaud me? 
If we are continually applauded by everybody, we must be pretty stupid. Because it is only such stupidity that can be universally appreciated. <laughs> Therefore, if the world turns upon us as it turned upon Socrates, upon Buddha, upon Jesus, upon Zoroaster, and upon Pythagoras, and upon Mohammed, if it reviles these persons, to what degree does it hurt them? Very little. Socrates was not hurt. As he pointed out, it was his accusers who would have to suffer. He was going to depart from them into a quietude and peace far from the dismay and dishevelment of Athens. They were going to have to live a little longer, therefore suffer a little longer. He was the one who was fortunate. He was going to all he had dreamed of, and they had to live with themselves with the, for the rest of their lives, knowing that they had wrought the death of an innocent man. They were the ones who had the bad time ahead, not him. And so it is with this entire concept, because if the individual, because he is nobler and better, he is the victim of persecution, he does not suffer too much. The wisdom that he possesses, the understanding which makes him more virtuous, that thing which has given him goodness has also given him strength. Because he understands, because he has transcended intemperance and has found tranquility within himself, his happiness does not depend upon the applause of others, nor can it be taken from him even by the emergency of death. Therefore, he is strangely and wonderfully blessed because he is immovable in the midst of motion. He is the one who understands, and therefore, like Lazarus in the play, Lazarus laughed. He is the only man whom the emperor cannot control. He is the man who knows within himself, therefore, he is not afflicted. It might seem that he is, but he is not. Because the good man living in the light cannot know the darkness. He has outgrown it. And no one else can force him into darkness. So by outgrowing, by living, we gain this inner tranquility, this inner poise that makes all peace possible to us. These are the things that we should be learning in psychotherapy because these are the important things that it is goodness, beauty, faith, hope, and charity within the inner parts of our lives that bring us help. And if we find these things, live them, glorify them, and become the teachers and manifestors of them, we shall have a good life and shall die with a good hope. And in these accomplishments, we will no longer be psychotic, because psychosis is conflict. And that which sees the principle and lives it cannot exist in conflict. So as conflict ceases, wear and tear ceases. And we live quietly, tranquilly, pleasantly, and in a friendly, gentle manner, enjoying the natural rewards of right action. These rewards being a right state of ourselves. I'm just